Like Hi, that. I'm Carl Kilfeather. And I'm Hunter Golden. And we're going to make Al laugh. A lot. You're welcome. <laughs> all kind of like we mesh very well today so welcome biz news I, i'm alfonso santanello hunter carl thank you guys so much for coming on to the all the way down the road, all the way down today apparently no it's not me it's Corey. it's uh, too much blue yeah we have to separate the blues today yes. i guess so that's Corey, and uh welcome to the show we have some we actually have five topics today so let's uh see how much we can Go through with uh, first one is Garmin is launching a portable head up display, which basically you can it will display the navigation on the windshield wiper now, not the wiper, the, the windshield. windshield glass. Yes, that <laughs> <laughs> you have to catch it. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> so it, it actually makes sense. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be too distracting for drivers now. Uh, but it's definitely a leap forward in, in for navigation, at least for the not in car in, units. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's great because you don't have to look down, which doesn't take very long for you to look away from the road to get in trouble. So having it right in front of you, even if you're on autopilot a little bit, it's right there. You can't miss it. Yeah, and you don't have to fumble with you know the buttons or anything. I was wondering how easy it would be because a lot of times you have a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. You know, is it easy for the passenger to see as well? But now that you're saying it's even easier to read, maybe you won't need a co-pilot. But I don't know my left or my right. Well, I wonder if, like, so. you know how, like, they have, like, the voices and you can pick, like, the languages mm -hmm. and, um, and the, like, the type of voices, male, female, accent, whatever. I wonder if they have, like, now, like, does a person, like, a hologram come up and say, I need it all right, or whatever, right, okay. in Spanish, or whatever, like. I would want to choose Dion. I would want Flavor Flav. <laughs> yeah. I was hoping for Yoda. <laughs> um, weird. But it's way cool. I mean, it looks futuristic because it's all glowing and, yeah. and really, really cool. It's, I mean, I think it, it's, I'm kind of surprised it took this long, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, but you've got a lot of things you've got to overcome. Obviously, you've got to come up with lighting issues. You've got to interact with the different kinds of auto glass a lot of different car brands use. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of knick-knacky things they're going to have to do. I wonder if it's going to be something that ends up being just a sort of a, a, an all-in-one inclusion with the car mm -hmm. and is built, you know, specific from brand to brand. We'll see. The next, we'll just go, we'll skip over and go right to the next car topic because it kind of makes sense. Apple is, uh, Apple Pen's an in-car entertainment and information system with tactile feedback. Um, they're pretty much bringing in the whole app system. I know that, like, Microsoft tried doing this with Ford and it didn't really yep. launch very well. Well, Apple's trying to, bring it in their own system. Um, so on Apple, in, uh, Apple Insider, uh, which is a website, uh, granted a patent today for an in-car touchscreen telemax system that will provide drivers with feedback to help them keep their eyes on the road. So I don't know if it's going to be like ludicrous as like, move bitch, get off the way. It will <laughs> pop up if they're like, there's traffic coming. Like, I don't know like, what it's going to be, but they're, they want like... <laughs> But they're talking about like like uh, apps like the stocks can be in a dashboard. Or people like there are more app options basically than what Microsoft probably did. I don't know. I look at products like this, and we were talking a little bit before you know we went on the air and everything. And I feel like Apple's starting to show some some cracks in the hull, so to speak, with yeah. some of their product development. And one of the big things you know that I think made Steve Jobs. Um, who he was, was his ability to so clearly identify space and throw all his creative resources in there, make a big mess, and create something that was really space-defining mm -hmm. yeah. um, and creating products that were unique unto themselves and, in, in essence, created a market. What I've noticed lately from Apple is a lot of brand confusion since he's really, you know, since he obviously passed away and stepped out of the picture. You know, I just watched their last, adver their, their last uh, advertising campaign, which was... Like Girl. a Zale, I don't know if you saw it. it. Was like it was like Zales jewelry commercial meets, you know, Best Buy. Some, yeah, like Best Buy. It was really. I haven't seen it. 
it. Weird. Like I was waiting for some guy in a top hat to start doing like ballerina twirls to the middle <laughs> <laughs> with an running? iPhone and, and the, the iPhone. iPhone. Yeah. And it was weird. And now I'm starting to notice with a lot of their product development, and this isn't the first thing that's come up. I mean, we've starting starting to recognize more of a noticeable trend over the last year of products that are just sort of piggybacking on other stuff, which is exactly what got them into trouble in the 1990s. And this kind of seems like one of those things, well, Microsoft screwed it up, so let's go spike the football and put out something that's barely functional to say that we beat them to that space. And, you know, that's just, to me, seems like a waste of resources. And it's not to say an idea like this doesn't have an incredible amount of potential if it's done right. Bob, is is this our first attempt in the automotive industry? Yeah, it is. It is for Apple. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree to a point. There's a unity of vision that they used to have that isn't there. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that they've been really smart about was building an ecosystem around sure. their products. Mm-hmm. I mean, the iPhone would not be as revolutionary as it was without the App Store, sure. without creating a marketplace. You know, the iPod would not have sold the way it did sure. if they didn't have the iTunes Store and a way for everything I to work together. iRadio wouldn't be so big without but, iTunes. I mean... You know, the iPad itself, <laughs> was like, by the time it came along, it was category defining, like you said, it was something new, but at the same time, it was really built on something that they had made very familiar. So it iPhone. wasn't a huge leap for our customers to make. Yeah, and that, that's a good point to bring up too, and I think where there's some overlap there too, especially with high-end cars, we're talking BMW, Mercedes, Apple really is a luxury brand. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a lot of mainstream appeal, obviously, there because of the functionality of the devices, but you know, people every year, they complain about that the new iPhone update isn't a huge update. Well, go watch BMW and Mercedes when they update the 7 Series every year. It's mm-hmm. subtle changes. Mm-hmm. Those products are designed so that people can own them for extended periods of time so that when they go to make their next purchase, which will be a high dollar value purchase, there are significant improvements. Mm-hmm. And so where I am optimistic on this on that front is that you know this is sort of, you know if they can stick with the luxury car brands, um, I think there's going to certainly at least be some marketplace comfort yeah. there for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do think one potential trouble spot is it sounds like they're trying to do a little too much. Like sure. ha- having car. directions and stuff projected right. on your windshield is one thing. Having a stock ticker and your Twitter feed. Well, what was that much. car that spoke to you, like the 80s TV show? For the car that oh. spoke? <laughs> Knight Rider? Yes. Yeah. It's like turning the car into Knight Rider. Oh, it's like yeah. you turn on, open the car, it's like, good morning, do you want coffee? And coffee can shoot out to you. <laughs> like, yes, that would be awesome. Yeah. If it oh, played the Knight Rider awesome. theme when you got in. <laughs> If Dave O'Hass's office sitting right next to you, it's in my head right now. Yeah, off just spits out of your dashboard. It's an amazing call pilot. Pilot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Next up, uh, there was an article from Huffington Post, which was kind of good. It was what Americans do when they're not at work. And, you know, the whole work life thing where people, it's not nine to five anymore, and there's a lot more of bringing work home. Time has really become, on what you do outside of work has changed. So, this was kind of a good. Quick, we'll do a quick over and we can kind of talk about whatever each one want to talk about. Number eight was organizational, civic, and religious activities. Number seven, educational activities. Number six, caring and caring for and helping household members. Number five, purchasing goods and services. Number four, eating and drinking. Number three, household activities. Number two, leisure and sports. And number one, personal care activities. What do eating and drinking kind of fall under personal care? Isn't that like life essential? Isn't it odd that that's like number six? Well, is drinking. Seems that's something for you? functionally that you have to do. Well, of course it is. For <laughs> <me>. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, well, this wasn't what I was expecting from this article. I was expecting something like um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, like, <laughs> they, just, like, like eight, eighteen people watch Big Bang Theory on when they get out of work. Like, right, what right, you, right, what right, exactly? Yeah, like that kind of very specifics. Very insightful. It's, no. We sleep and chill out. We function. <laughs> we manscape. <laughs> I do, frequently. And you know what the proportion of, uh, of time spent helping uh, members of the household, I thought that was really small, it was like half an hour on average. Yeah, so, let me see. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just talking about like your, if you have elderly parents or grandparents right, right. with you know, illnesses, it's like so caring for your own children. So it looks like we watch a lot of TV and shop and spend very little time with our children. Yeah, and it says terrible parents. half an hour caring and for yeah. helping household members. So you spend half hour a day after Kids work. are a part-time job. <laughs> Barely part-time. Clearly. Well, they're saying um, <laughs> we spend the most. Let me tell you with two girls. No, well, what they're saying is it's not even yeah, close yeah. to a part-time job. No, it's... But it really is. So I, I don't like the article. Okay. I don't like I it. It's not should. approved. It does <laughs> seem like, like it's really reflective of, of what I see. 
Should we start like a Corey Nunn approved thumbs down kind yeah, of? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, you know, I'm look, I'm in the market for a hobby. I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> she sold the so, home. Now so, she wants a hobby. So, <laughs> I was so for something like interesting, like intriguing. not liking stuff. You know, <laughs> it's like this was what grinds my gears. Thumbs down. Uh, next up in Russia, there's a new program where the checkout counters can check you out. That's what the article is called. It's from Fast Company. Customers in one of Russia's largest cosmetic chains are about to encounter something different. The counters will read facial expressions and register their emotions whenever people make a purchase. Mm -hmm. So depending on what they're buying, the they will scan the face, remember the emotions, and then advertising and marketing campaigns can be directed to people who are feeling that thing for that specific product. It's good. I think it's good for marketing, but it's really creepy at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised they're pioneering this in Russia because I have a feeling that in a communist country, they have a very high level of tolerance for being spied on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to want to say it. But, you know, I know that you've had those trips to yeah, CVS like where I do not want anybody to know I'm walking out with a pint of anything and then, you know, have something go off and say, oh, you look bloated. Right? Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's where the tissues are. Here's well, the I mean, sex. Like, for me, I'm a twin. We don't look exactly the same, but, like, what if it was, like, I go in one day, and it's like, oh, yesterday you bought, you know, I don't want to say anything, whatever, but, and it's not me, and it's him. You know, how is that going to really change that? Yeah. Or know, if it pulls in other people because it said it can send you a text message, so what if, you know, the, oh, the person behind you thought you smelled bad, you know, the order right. something is like distracting week. your natural or Yeah, your the person behind you stuck their tongue out at you. yeah. You're just annoyed with the cashier or something. You look like you could use breakfast. I'm angry with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's just creepy. We're, I, and I guess this is a kind of common theme through all the episodes, the, all the topics. There's a, a big push, and we're always talking about like the future, the future, and it's all kind of happening right now in a sense mm -hmm. of like where technology is going. Yeah. I think you look in the next like five, ten years on what's going to yeah. be completely different from what it is now. Innovation is definitely being pushed. But I'm with you on Apple showing their cracks. I just don't know, you know, everybody's going to try to push their new innovation to the new limits. So, but what I'm saying is, is that, <laughs> you know, how many times are we going to come out with something and it's going to fail? You know, if it's going to come out in Russia, like, how long is it until other companies, you know, go after this as well? And is it really successful? What are they really getting? Well, out there of? is another company uh, that is doing something with facial recognition in Europe, which is they're, they're placing... Uh, cameras or camera type fa facial recognition um, on build not necessarily billboards but like uh, you know like those movie posters mm -hmm. or and you see them in like the convenience stores and, and the malls and out in the lobbies and so now they're gonna track who's actually looking at them male female yep. um, right. age so I mean it's yeah, really true, it's true yeah because if you go to like the, you want to buy a billboard they're gonna tell you sixty thousand eyeballs drive by this every day. Right. How many people are actually like looking at that billboard? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how many cars drive by. Right. I mean, it could give you results, but I don't know if it would ever. Part of me wonders whether it would give you much of a trend over an extended period of time. That would be anything that would be offline from what your local demographic data would be. I mean, you can um, target probably a little better, but yeah, I think it would be incremental. Yeah, I'm not so sure how useful that data would be. I mean, in baseball, they have pitch FX now. They track every single pitch that a pitcher throws from the number of rotations on the ball to the amount of vertical break on, say, a curveball or split or whatever it so happens to be. And what it allows you to do is recognize you know, some certain trends over time. So a pitcher may be throwing a pitch a particular way, and it might indicate an injury you know, mm -hmm. or a drop of velocity or what have you. But it only really tells you what happened until you get a huge sample. There's really not much that you can yeah. infer from it. And this is kind of a similar thing in the sense that, you know, uh, it's really so almost circumstantial. I mean, in a lot of pitching, you know, the weather, the park, that's really going to dictate how a lot of pitchers will approach a game. Mm -hmm. Same thing, you know, when you're talking about local drive-by data on billboards. And so I kind of wonder what really, you know, how well, the, useful that's going to be. Well, yeah, I mean, this is not something they can do for a year in Tesla. This has got to be something that's been got to keep going right. five, right. ten years. I actually see if it's... Yeah, if sample's got to be true. You need to, to aggregate expensive. a lot of data. Yeah. yeah. I want it to be like, because I have a lot of buyer's remorse, <laughs> I do a lot of returns, so I want to be able to like turn it on and then like go out on a day with me like shopping like <laughs> in my cell phone or something and then like go home and like really watch if I really wanted that or not. Watch it, <laughs> go back yeah, and see like, it's like, mm, mm, 
that. Oh, you have a lot of Corey faces, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that. <laughs> There's that one. I mean, I won't do them all there, like, but. like, in the dressing room with you? That'd be kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit similar. I get like a tidal wave of emotions when I'm in the mood to buy something. And then I have to like walk it off for five minutes. And if I can't shake it in that five minutes, yeah. then I go buy it. But then if I don't, you know, if I can shake it off, I'll walk out. I'll get over it. Maybe that's a move I should See, I'm an insta I don't, when I go and like, I know I want to like buy a shirt, I don't go and I just go whatever I find, I'll grab. I don't try it on it and I bring it home. If it doesn't fit, then I'll return it or I'll just give it to like someone else. I'm not really a shopper, so like when I go to the stores, it's just I go in and out. I don't like the, I don't have the five minutes is the time I spend from getting out of the car, going to the store, shopping, and I'm already in the car. Yeah, sure. I mean, I go mission shopping too, but I always end up grazing, especially when you become a parent and you have kids, mm -hmm. and sometimes like to go buy that shirt or you know to go pick up the formula. That's your time, right? It's yeah. your <laughs> time. Like that's your yeah. that's your precious five or ten how minutes. Many, how many Hello Kitty shirts did you have to buy? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Princesses uh, stuff. I regularly get decorated. Set up to hypnotize you a little bit. So you start walking <laughs> in more, circles aimlessly. Yeah. I have more bling bling than a Christmas tree. <laughs> so. uh, last up, how? Uh, so it's not necessarily new, but it's uh, the post office is can sell your address to anyone who actually wants to pay for it. Um, so whenever you fill out the change of address form in the United States Post Office, uh, it adds new details into the database. Um, where basically it's the bottom of the form, unless you see it and you check it off and say don't do it, it's gonna. I wonder can... if I checked the box recently. That's very uh, interesting. Yeah, we should have shown this to you last week or in 1986 when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, when I was changing my address, so you go through that, um, you know, you can get magazine subscriptions yeah. and stuff, and obviously it did no thanks, no thanks, you know. But they definitely try to solicit you on those right away. Oh, yeah. But I don't remember seeing the box. I get hammered. I got hammered when we bought our house last year. We got hammered with solicitations for about a month. Just on everything. Yeah, the last time I moved, I couldn't believe how quickly everything. I started getting the pre-approved credit card offers. Oh, same thing with me when I moved into the office. With the telemarketers, the mail, and it, it, it's an office, not even a mm -hmm. home address. And I was getting bombarded with yeah. stuff. It's in, insane. Uh, well, it says that uh, on the form, there's a fine print when you sign up. Uh, in quotes, we do not disclose your personal information to anyone except in accordance to, with the Privacy Act. Uh, then it lists a number of exceptions, including, in quotes, to mailers if already in possession of your name and old, ma old mailing addresses as an address right, correction Right, they only do service. it if they already have your address. So if they already have, like, your old address and mm -hmm. you move, they can give them your new address. So basically, they'll just give it. So if you're trying so to So we don't give out your address to anybody except for the people we give it to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Essentially. And here we've been angry at the NSA. Yeah. <laughs> the post office <laughs> yes. is behind it all. Yeah. I feel we their pain. They I know they're not making this. any money. I know they're losing money and they're making money by selling the lists and they're making the money off the postage that people pay to mail this stuff to. I know, I wonder how much stamps are going to get up to now. It's like going to be like five hours to mail out an envelope. Everything, you can do everything online now. Yeah. Nobody wants this stuff. Well, ready for paid postage for emails. Mm -hmm. Sooner or right. later. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, it's gonna, there's already ads in every email application there is. Yeah. So. All right, guys. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, we will be right back with this guy. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and find out a little bit more on what he does with the right stuff copywriting. <laughs> Welcome back to Biz News. I am Alfonso. I'm here with Hunter Golden of Right Stuff Copywriting. Uh, Hunter, how did you come up with the name Right Stuff? Right Stuff? Well, that's what I do, right? I just write stuff. And, you know, it was really funny. I go down to ad agencies all the time. And you, know, you always have to give, like, your, your elevator speech, right? They always tell us about yourself and tell us what you do. And what do you do during the day? Well, I write stuff. So that's pretty much what I do. So I think that's pretty functional as a name, and that's where I kept it at. Plain and simple. So what exactly are your the services that you provide with copywriting? Well, I uh, write content pretty much all over the spectrum. Everything from advertising, copywriting, to online content, to content strategies, obviously huge now. I mean, you're in marketing, so you know that... You know, for years, the design industry and search and social and content, we all kind of circled each other. It was like that really awkward, like, 
eighth grade dance where the boys <laughs> sit on one section and the girls on the other and the geeks yeah. in the middle. And now, today, the way things have evolved, you really need to have a lot of cross-channel fluency yeah. in everything. And design has to meet content, which has to meet search and social. And everybody's got to have at least a baseline understanding of everything that's going on. So content strategy is something I've been doing a lot of in recent years. I'll work very closely with Citigroup on that, working with Blackboard currently um, on a new website design where a lot of that's being incorporated. Also still do a lot of old school blogging, press release and article writing, just content crunching. And um, you know, obviously content is still king. I hate that tagline, it drives me nuts. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's so cliche, but unfortunately it is still true and fortunately for business. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, so I do a little bit of everything and so on the side, I also run ESPN's Red Sox blog. I was just gonna say, you also have stuff outside of that. Uh, I mean, it's still yeah. writing, but it's, sure. uh, how did you get involved with that? Uh, to be honest with you, my background was always in sports journalism. That's always sort of where I had seen myself working. And uh, I got laid off a long time ago. And sort of in between jobs, I was like, well, you know, I can make some extra scratch stringing for newspapers and mm -hmm. uh, local baseball games. And so, you know, I'd go out and sort of scratch the proverbial itch, you know, doing that. Um, but once I got into copywriting, I got into marketing, and I started doing that, um, that obviously fell off to the side, and sort of to have that, to maintain that hobby, I started my own blog, Baseball New England, on the side. And uh, I kept up with that for about two years. I cooked up a decent little audience. It wasn't anybody really intended to be anything for anybody other than me, my friends, and anybody mm -hmm. else who tripped over it. And eventually I got uh, discovered, essentially, on Twitter. Nice. Um, and I'm, you know, at, at Hunter G Baseball, I'm on Twitter for pretty much every Red Sox game, machine gun Twittering, just about everything. And uh, so I got picked up by ESPN through that. I made a bunch of great contacts. Uh, I started up with ESPN last July. Uh, I was named editor of the blog in January. Nice. So very kind of quick ascension there. But um, it focuses basically on all things Red Sox, uh, but specifically advanced metrics. So sabermetrics, if you've seen the movie Moneyball. Um, and you saw Peter Brand, who was the fat guy that Jonah Hill played. That was me. Um, and we track everything from, you know, pitch data to, you know, how, you know, players are performing to market valuations. We really do a lot of the high-level stuff. So, um, again, that's really more for fun. I get paid for it. It's nice. I'm on the power rankings every week for ESPN. Um, so that's a real treat. Uh, but, no, that's pretty much more of a side gig for me that I use to kind of, you know, feed that side of me, and uh, it's still a lifelong dream of mine that someday um, I would love to work in Major League Baseball front office. I definitely don't have right the here. athletic ability. No, I can't hit a beach ball, <laughs> and I can't hit the floor if I threw a brick at it. <laughs> but I can trade some players. Hey, so what? So what are your future goals with the uh, copyright? What is your future goals with? What is your future goals with Rice off copywriting? Well, the content industry is one that's really evolving, and it's kind of fun to be riding the wave right now and seeing where everything is going. What I've really enjoyed is sort of developing, like I was saying before, that cross-channel fluency, mm -hmm. that ability to learn more about design and uh, become more involved in search and social, and that's really where I've started to push my business is more out of just the communications end of it, and which obviously is it's a great skill of mine. I'm good at it, and I enjoy doing uh, but being able to bring in all those other tools is great. Now we're starting to get to the point where I'm starting to consider getting a little bit bigger with it. And, um, you know, we're going to cross that, that bridge when we come to it. Yeah. Um, but right now we're still cultivating those skills, building up that network. And, and that's certainly, I think, where the end goal is going to be. Great. Is there, what is the website? So if people want to look you up www.writestuffcopywriting.com, W R I T E, for you people that if it's right and it's copy of writing w-r-i-t-i-n-g not writing I don't get it get it right i'm not cool <laughs> i'm not giving you an excuse to sue people <laughs> all right uh, hunter thank you again so much for coming on check out uh the website visit him, give him a call and uh we will be right back Same. I want to thank Hunter and Carl for coming on uh we had a great episode today a lot of fun and um hunter Thanks us a lot. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yes. I'm going to start trying that. You're welcome. <laughs> Shakethebusiness.com. We'll see you guys next week.